Hello everybody, let's go over Chapter 5, Magazines, The Power of Words and Images. Magazines were the first national media. They began with a broad appeal and have become more and more specialized throughout time. And this has proven to be successful for them. They cater to specific interests like men's health, fashion, computers, fishing, etc. There's a magazine available for almost every demographic. And their format has really allowed them to transition to web versions easily. And they have managed to build relationships with their audience that helps bring in advertising revenue and keeps them successful during all the technology changes that we talk so much about in this class. Let's look at what a magazine is. Uh, the word magazine is derived from another word that means a place where goods or supplies are stored. So it's a periodical that contains articles of lasting interest. So it's not necessarily the news of the minute and it may not be um, in close proximity of your home, but magazines are targeted at specific groups of people. They cater to articles a specific audience would be interested in reading and they get money from advertising because they have reigned in these specific demographics through subscriptions and newsstand sales. The magazine industry has a long history starting with the colonial period. Around 1704, the review was born in England by author Daniel Defoe who went on to write Robinson Crusoe. But in the beginning, they resembled the broadsheet newspapers. So Defoe's publications focused not on news, but on public policy, literature, and morals. In the United States, the magazine began with a feud um, between Benjamin Franklin and Andrew Bradford. Bradford ended up stealing Franklin's editor, John Webb, and he ended up publishing American Magazine, which was the first one in the States, just three days before Ben Franklin's publication, The General Magazine, hit the stands. More than a hundred magazines were published before 1800, and they contained articles and reprints from newspapers and they were pretty open to steal content from wherever they wanted because at that time there were no copyright laws in place. The Saturday Evening Post was one of the most significant early magazines. It came on the scene in 1821 and it was a general magazine that stayed away from local coverage and it contained poetry and obituaries and stories and the ladies friend column. It also ran advertisements uh, and had the famous Norman Rockwell covers that that we're all pretty familiar with and they're just kind of a lasting image of US society and it was a national magazine. The Post went through most of the transitions that have shaped the modern magazine industry. Uh, it began to falter because its appeal was too broad. It, it tried to reach too many people like the newspaper and then um, it went from being a weekly magazine to a monthly magazine to a bi-monthly magazine and then to a nostalgia magazine so some of the changes in the magazine industry are less issues and uh, a narrower appeal. The Saturday Evening Post was a really important part of the mass communication landscape until the introduction of television which forced the magazine industry into what it is today which is mostly really narrowly focused content Photojournalism is a really important part of the history of magazines because they were the first to uh, print hand engraved and half tone images. They were the ones that popularized news in photographs with commentary and the graphic images drew readers in quickly. And half tone images are the ones that you see with the series of dots that make up a black and white image. It's kind of like pixels but in newsprints they use circles. Matthew Brady was the first popular photojournalist. Um, he and his team recorded the Civil War through black and white images, and he's often cited as the first photojournalist. But he had bad eyesight, and he probably didn't take most of the pictures. Um, rather, he operated the dark room and ran the team of photographers who created the images of the war. And then they were credited to Brady. And Brady's team was really daring, and they would go very close to war in danger zones and get images. He had a really high turnover rate because a lot of people left the job because they thought they wouldn't survive taking the photographs. And then in 1864, Harper's Weekly began running images in their magazines and it was just this wildly successful move for them. Everyone wanted to see the images of the war. Brady really championed 
the idea of photographs being a historical record of history and thus began the mass media obsession with images as documents and the importance of photojournalism to report a story more fully with images. So let's look at the different types of magazines in circulation. We have consumer magazines, and these are targeted magazines, the ones that focus on a very narrow audience of like-minded people like Glamour and Fishing and Shutterbug or Macworld. They cater to specific demographics, and they supply advertising and products that appeal to those specific groups. So this is the biggest and most successful type of magazine and the type that most of us um, pick up when we're standing in line at the grocery store. And then we also have trade magazines and these are industry specific or business to business for professionals who work in a specific field like Accountant Daily or Pipeline Magazine. These are less colorful and sometimes smaller than consumer magazines and most of the time they're unlikely to be heard of outside of the industry that they cater to. So advertisers really like trade magazines because they know that the people who read them are likely to purchase the products. There are more individual trade magazines than consumer magazines, but they have smaller audiences. So it's kind of like that idea of the long tail. There's a whole bunch of them, but they're, they cater to specific smaller groups. And then we also have literary magazines. And literary magazines focus on essays and short fiction. And these have a very long history, but only a few of them have survived since the 1800s. Um, Harper's and Atlantic, to name a few. So these types of magazines are not a big draw for advertisers. They usually have really small circulations. And so many get revenue from endowments and donations. So literary magazines and commentaries are based on giving a voice to a cause or important cultural aspects of society like literature. The Atlantic is a literary journal and is one of the few magazines that's left in circulation that still publishes poetry and nonfiction. Um, it's had to cut back its issues to about 10 per year instead of 12, but it's still doing well in the 21st century where um, a lot most of the magazines of this type have really floundered. And The Republic and Nation are political journals that came out of the late 19th and early 20th century. They're just collections of opinionated discussion boards that deal with political issues in society like working class and civil rights and anti-fascism. And one of the things that's really helped these survive is that they have a component of reader feedback and that has helped these magazines build relationships with the readers. The National Review was founded in 1955 as a response to the New Republic and Nation uh, and it's from a conservative point of view. And a fun fact about these political magazines is that the Opposing View magazine gains readers when, when the other is in office. So um, if Democrats are in office, the Conservative View magazine gains readership. If Republicans are in office, then the Democratic magazines gain readership. The Crisis Magazine was started as the official voice for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1910, a man named W.E.B. Dubois. And then by the 90s, uh, the crisis had become a consumer magazine that was targeted um, to African Americans. And then the NAACP stepped in and shut it down for about a year and reformatted it into its old intellectual style. Henry Lucci was very influential in the magazine world. He developed Time, Fortune, and Life magazine. Um, Time was a weekly magazine that showcased the week's news. Time openly rejects true objectivity and has a very opinionated feel to it. While they, Time really strives to present both sides of a story, but they always make clear where they stand on the issues. And Time began in the 1920s. It was followed by Fortune magazine, which was geared towards reflecting industrial life through pictures and articles. Lucci believed that people liked getting news through pictures, and he also started Life magazine in 1936. And Life featured the work of famous industrial photographer Margaret Bork White. Um, she also took pictures for Fortune, and the idea of news through photography really paid off because all of these publications are still in circulation today. 
Later, he started Sports Illustrated, which the critics said would fail, and we all know what happened with that. Women's magazines are one of the most successful categories in the consumer sect. Uh, they got their start with Godey's Lady Book in 1830, and it was published by Louis Godey and edited by Sarah Josepha Hale for 40 years. It survived for a while without Hale, but it was never the same um, without her direction. It was a place where women writers could be published in the same pages as male authors for the first time. Um, and their names were used, so it wasn't a secret that they were women, and the male pen names for women writers began to disappear, and it was very, very bold for its time. So Godey's began to shape the women's magazine market, which flourishes today. It's one of the you know, best-selling categories of consumer magazines. So let's look at some of the different types of magazines that came out of this women's magazine genre. Godey's was a women's service magazine, and it helped build the foundation for the Seven Sisters, which includes Good Housekeeping, McCall's Red Book, Ladies' Home Journal, Woman's Day, Better Homes and Gardens, and Family Circle. And each of these service magazines helped women deal with all things traditional, so the home, the family, and quality of life. And then we have FBLs, which are fashion, beauty, and lifestyle magazines. Vogue, Glamour, Harper's Bazaar are all in this category. And these magazines have about 40 million readers every month. So fashion, beauty, lifestyle magazines focus more on clothes and style, and they leave out content on lifestyle. Vogue has been around since 1892, and they do add some content other than fashion like editorials on fashionable people and then they have just tons and tons and tons of advertising. Cosmopolitan kind of focuses on practical advice about a wide range of topics that concern young unmarried women and it's now geared more towards the career woman, um, fashion, sex, health, and beauty. So these are just kind of the different types of women's magazines that are out there since Godey started that whole trend. And then, of course, we have men's magazines, and many men's magazines focus on hobbies and interests. And as it turns out, one of men's interests is women. So there has been a large market for men's magazines that feature women. The original pinup magazine was Esquire, which was very controversial when it came out in 1933. And it was very popular with the troops during World War II. Uh, but Esquire also published works by noted writers like Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, as well as airbrush paintings of beautiful, scantily clad ladies. And they ran into trouble with obscenity laws at the time. And recently, the magazine has had a bit of an identity crisis. Um, they kept changing their formula, and this caused a decline in circulation. And then in 2000, the magazine returned to its start and focused on good writing and started pulling in an upscale audience again. And Hugh Hefner actually got his start at Esquire doing circulation and promotion for the magazine. Hugh Hefner, as we all know, then ventured out on his own and started Playboy with $7,000. And he had the first issue, which featured nude pictures of Marilyn Monroe. The magazine always promoted the sexually free good life and it was designed to appeal to young men from the cities. It ran interesting articles by good writers and nude pictures. So Hefner branched his company out into merchandise and nightclubs and television and became a very, very rich man. And then in 1993, Maxim hit the scene, which is basically cosmopolitan magazine for men. Um, it appeals to adolescent ideals of women and while featuring gadgets, advice, health, sports, and other topics that interest men. Uh, Maxim has been so successful that a lot of other men's magazines have kind of followed suit, and many media platforms began to appeal to the inner guy, like cable television with guy TV and movies for guys and the Fuel Channel, these types of things that really appeal to that inner guy persona that um, was first put forward by these magazines, basically. One of the biggest criticisms about magazines is their portrayal um, and effect on 
women's body image. In 1972, 23% of women said that they were dissatisfied with their bodies. And then by 1996, 48% of women said they were dissatisfied with their bodies. So this has largely been blamed on the magazine industry and their portrayal of unrealistic beauty for young women. The size of women shown in magazines has went from a size 12, like Marilyn Monroe, which is now considered plus size, to Kate Moss's heroine chic. Dove did an ad campaign of alternative beauty, which featured pictures of regular women um, who were beautifully photographed by photographer icon Annie Leibovitz in 2005. And they continued this campaign by showing aging women in their 50s as beautiful nude models. Uh, magazines have occasionally been showing more and more relatable female figures due to pressure from advertisers and studies that show that these images really impact women and girls in negative ways. In 2007, uh, the Madrid Fashion Week actually banned super thin models. They measured body mass index to decide who made the cut. So some things are changing as far as body image is concerned and how it's portrayed in the media. And the mass media is really starting to consider their effect on society in this way and, and the raise in anorexia and um, basic dissatisfaction with the way that we look based on these images we see every day. So let's look at advertising versus editorial control. Editorials run spreads of models wearing clothes by designers, which advertises their brands. And advertisers are the revenue source for the magazine. And so they have a lot of control over the magazines themselves. And there is a constant power struggle between the two departments within a magazine to show content that sets trends and weighs in on the issues of fashion and consumer worlds and appeasing advertising investors at the same time. So there's a lot of synergy in this world um, with spreads, articles, beauty products being favored by magazines in order to match everything up. They endorse advertisers throughout their publications in many ways um, and the advertisement and information lines get blurred badly. So if you're reading an issue of Cosmopolitan magazine they might have oh, the 10 best tricks to better skin and they'll list products within those reviews and so they're endorsing those products and saying that they're the best while that company is advertising with them and that blurs the the line between advertisement and editorial content also some ads are referred to as advertorials which is an ad placed in a magazine um, that looks like editorial content. So it's designed to be seen as a legitimate article, but it's actually an advertisement for a specific company or product. The magazine cover is the launch pad for circulation numbers. The cover is seen as the thing that determines how much a magazine sells. Um, Dick Stoley, who was one of the founding editors of People Magazine, said that there are rules for the cover which must be followed in order for magazines to sell. And these are Dick Stoley's cover rules. Young is better than old. Pretty is better than ugly. Rich is better than poor. Music is better than movies. Movies are better than television. And nothing is better than a dead celebrity because the point of a cover is to get you to buy that publication. And if you look through Stoli's rules, um, he was probably right. Magazine covers rarely feature non-white women, um, and this has been changing in recent years with the rise of successful celebrity women of color. Um, teen music magazines often feature non-whites. In 2002, less than 20% of magazine covers featured people of color. And as of 2009, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue had featured only two women of color on their cover. But like I said, this is changing and uh, we're seeing a lot more diverse groups of people in the media. Magazines have been successful in the 21st century by building relationships with readers, providing information that is hard to find elsewhere, adapting to social changes, uh, and adapting to new media like the internet. Um, they keep advertisers interested and they adjust to the economy by doing things like um, printing less issues and helping shape and define the major issues of society. 
and they do these things to stay relevant and to stay in business and they've they've adapted better than a lot of other print media thanks for listening to my lecture here about magazines i hope you have a great day and i look forward to seeing you thanks here are your study guide questions for chapter five who was the pioneer of photojournalism what was he photographing and what was this founder's greatest contribution to photojournalism? What does the term muckraking mean in journalism? What are Dick Stoley's rules for successful magazine covers? Magazines are frequently charged with contributing to eating disorders in young women. Why do critics say this? What do magazine defenders say in response?